Hello, Jennifer Byrne here and welcome to the vodcast for ABC TV's First Tuesday Book Club, the show for people who are passionate about books and reading. For other vodcasts like this, go to abc.net.au slash tv slash video and don't forget to watch the show on ABC TV. Enjoy. I'm Jennifer Byrne and thanks for joining me as we get down and dirty with some serious crime. Since Sherlock Holmes first picked up his magnifying glass and headed out of 221B Baker Street, readers have been on a crime jag. You only need to wander into a bookshop or an airport pretty much anywhere around the world to see just how popular it is. One out of every three novels sold are crime books. So. What is it about crime that inspires such devotion? Tonight, we are going to have our own investigation. We've assembled our specialist team, all of whom write on the subject and bring with them a love for crime fiction, and in one case, a very poetic passion. So let's meet them. Shane Maloney is a Melbourne writer best known for his laconic and humorous crime series featuring accidental detective Murray Whelan. The Brush Off won the 1997 Ned Kelly Award for Best Australian Crime Novel. The sixth novel in the Murray Whelan series, Sucked In, was released in May. Dorothy Porter is a Melbourne-based writer and teacher who specialises in poetry. Her verse novel, The Monkey's Mask, won the 1994 Age Book of the Year for Poetry. Her latest work is El Dorado, a murder mystery verse novel set in Melbourne. Poetry should create all these extra dimensions. The words should push against the boundaries of the senses. Graham Blundell is well known as an actor, director, producer, writer and biographer. He lifted it and felt the weight of it and he said, is that really all about me? And he wasn't joking, uh, apparently. I was very touched by that. Uh. He is also a journalist and book reviewer for the Australian newspaper. His most recent book was King, Life and Comedy of Graham Kennedy. Ian Callanan recently retired from the High Court, where he had served since 1998. He is also a playwright and novelist, author of crime books including The Lawyer and the Libertine and Appointment at Amalfi. And here they are in the flesh, Shane Maloney, Dorothy Porter, Graham Blundell and Ian Callanan. OK, now, given the immense size of the subject, I thought we'd have a look first at the different uh, subjects, the different genres of crime, which is also a way of looking at how the whole crime writing business began. So let's start with the early puzzle-solving type crime. And I thought P.D. James summed this up beautifully when she wrote, We are here, ten of us on this small and lonely island, and one of us is a murderer. Now, that is the classic, <laughs> woo classic Agatha Christie plot, isn't it? And though it sounds a little bit old-fashioned nowadays, it's where most of us, I think, got our introduction to crime. Was it true for you? Agatha Christie, certainly not. No? no? no you no, wouldn't go near no, her? No, 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 old lady stuff. No, no, no. no. <laughs> No, I wanted the, the, the you know punchy, hard-boiled guys. That was that was my thing. Well, we'll come to that. But it was sort of cosy crime, as it's known. That sort of you know was early in the pantheon. She was edgy. She was a lot edgier than she's given credit for. I, I think uh, Christie, yeah. and she did do down the sort of the, the plotting coppers as well. You know, setting that up generically as well as the lock room murder and things. But in fact, the lock room murder goes back even further. But it, arguably the. The, uh, the whole genre of crime fiction starts with Edgar Allan Poe, with the um, murders in the Rue Morgue, where the uh, ape did it. 
the, yes. lock, the locked room, who did it, who got in, who could climb up eight storeys. It turns out to be the ape. But the ape is, is uncovered by the, uh, the amateur detective, uh, Auguste Dupin, who uh, goes in search using the, the power of the brain with a sidekick. So we get, we, we get with Poe the, the, the sidekick, we get the locker room murder, and we get the strange, violent killer who happens to be an ape. My first, uh, my, the first adult novel I read was The Body in the Library by Agatha Christie when I was 12. And I'm still reading Agatha Christie. And I agree with Graham that um, Agatha is a lot more edgy than people give her credit for. Um, I've reminded, um, when I've had some tough questions about writing about a child killer myself, um, I've reminded uh, the punters that, in fact, um, Murder on the Orient Express is about a particularly brutal child murder. Mm. That's at the heart of it. But it's always in either a locked train carriage or an island or an English country house or somewhere remote, isn't it? It is. It also, there's another aspect that goes back to Christie, the, the, the idea, and we see it in so much television crime these days, that all these murders all happen within the space of four or five hundred yards. You know, <laughs> ten people killed. You know, just there, there, there. Like there. midsummer. Midsummer murders. <laughs> Ian, are you, are you a bit of a fan of cosy well, crime? Yeah, well, I liked her, but I'm a child of the 40s, so I spent a lot of time at matinees watching Humphrey Bogart, so I go straight to Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett. But I, I like Agatha Christie. I've read her and... OK, well, she's very clever. and of course, I mean, Noah Marsh, Dorothy Sayers, yes. um, the whole genre, there's a whole Lord, cast of them. Lord Peter Whimsey and... Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're back too. The cosy novel is huge again following the, the great success of uh, the serial killer novel. I think people got sick of the sheer unmitigated violence and gore of the serial killer novel. And, uh, turned, and the bad writing. And the bad writing. With some of it. And turned to the bad writing of the contemporary cosy. Um, <laughs> you know. I think particularly sexual violence. <clears throat> it was almost as if I, I, there's one particular scene in uh, James Elroy's The Big Nowhere. Um, Graham and I have talked about this before. I won't say what, what the particular sexual crime is, but it is beyond belief. It is horrible beyond belief. It, it is extremely well done, but you, you, you almost think that's about as far as it can go. Well, OK, let's move on to that 30s, 40s, hard-boiled private investigator. Basically, these were pretty much always men. They always had a drinking problem. <laughs> they, um, they basically were, they spoke in very short, sharp sentences and they were a kind of a tough loner. Well, they were always very melancholy. Mm. And they were also very alluring. Usually they attracted the bad girls. <laughs> yes. yes but, but they resisted. They resisted. They, they were too, and, ver too and they virtuous for anything. Yeah. They didn't so much solve the crime um, because of their razor-sharp intellect. No. They, they entered into a situation where a crime had taken place and things were generally calming down. People thought they'd got away with it. And suddenly this character appears who goes around asking questions and yeah. upsets the, upsets the, the, the equilibrium, yeah. begins knocking over the furniture. What can you do? You can sap him over the head with an iron bar. You can send the Gets goons up. out to get him. Mm. A man can walk through the door with a gun. Mm. All of these uh, attempts can be made to kind of throw him off the trail. But what, what is crucial about that character is indeed the qualities of the character. Uh, in, you, in you're no longer interested yeah. in, in the plot per se because essentially you can't work yeah. it out. I don't think but it's any accident that Raymond Chandler started as a poet because I think particularly the the and the, Christi, the the Marlowe the Philip Marlowe books and I and I think he was basing it the, the, the name even comes from from Christopher Marlowe yeah. have the concision and um, uh, succinctness and yeah, laconic yeah. style of poetry and and also the plot doesn't matter so much also it relies yeah, tremendously yeah. on a kind yeah. of ravishing imagery. Well, uh, Evelyn War uh, said he thought he was the best author. He and Woodhouse were the two best authors yeah. of the century. He said, and well, so they all went to school together. Auburn War told me that his father, uh, his father thought that. And you're right about the plot. The mm. plot doesn't matter. I, I've forgotten which one it was, but there was one that they were making a film of, and the <coughs> director big rang sleep. up, mm. big yeah. sleep, and he yeah. said, "There's a body that's yeah. unaccounted for." William Faulkner was writing yeah. the screenplay, and 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 Billy Wilder was directing. They rang up and said, "Who killed the driver?" <laughs> <laughs> Damned if I know. Right. Right. So right. it's not just character, which is your point, Jamie. It's also mood, isn't it? I mean, that was yeah. hence the noir was it was mm. dark well, they and from urban. The, they merged from the pulp novels to some extent, and uh, and Hemingway was an immense influence as well. Uh, so the colour comes from the the pulp stuff, all those 
those uh, original writers were pulp writers writing dime novels, as they were called, and uh, where, where you had to establish things really fast and the colour was saturated and uh, thrown around as if from a, from a paint can. In those days, we, you know, we had James M. Cain, um, obviously. McCoy, yeah, yeah. 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 But the modern ones, what, Elroy, Elmore Leonard, who would you point to as the inheritors of that hard-boiled tradition? Well, nearly all of them are hard-boiled yeah. these days, except for that particular genre of, mm. of contemporary cosies, uh, many of which have a kind of sexual separatist mm. agenda. Yeah. Um, they're really a genre that uh, I once thought should be known as uh, these should not be read as crime fiction, that genre. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, He's well, a very big so tree and he casts a lot of shade. I would, yeah. I would say that I owe a lot to him. Yeah. I mean, yes, I, I, my, yeah. my, my character, yeah. it's the, yeah. it's the your... first person narrative the, the, the guy who's trying to do his best in the, in the middle of, a, of the confusion yeah. of it all, um, who, who triggers events, acts as a catalyst by his mere presence. Well, I would yes. never have thought of Murray Whelan as an Oh, a, no, you, you're, a hard some of your imagery reminded me of Chandler's imagery. And your wit as well, the one-liners, yeah, no, the, very good. the comic set pieces as well. But I think even the ones that um, are in the first person um, as, as, as women characters, as, um, as I've done, owe a huge amount to Raymond Chandler. I, I think that the creation of, that, particularly of that intimate voice that talks mm. in that um, that dark and witty yeah. and ex intimately honest voice to the reader is absolutely compelling when it's done well. But yeah. I must ask you, I mean, putting, you know, putting Chandler to one side yeah. briefly, because he is one of the kings of that. Generally speaking, women did not get a good deal in the hard-boiled novel. I mean, they, they were they were good for being, you know, yeah. the dame on heels, yeah. and they were good for being but the body. For being the body. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, I, they weren't really yeah. bad. They were just yeah. drawn that yeah. way. Yeah. But they weren't getting much of a good deal in real life either. Yeah. You know, it was, it was yeah. just reflecting the yeah. way yeah. things were. That's, why, I, that's yeah. why I'm really happy when I see, you know, women writers adopt the genre and use it to their own purpose, mm. rather than say, oh, look, the genre is so misogynistic and so shop or we won't touch it. Um, because I think, yes, you know, women in it are sort of victims or bad girls. Um, but certainly women can have um, victims and bad boys. Mm. Well, let's, let's go to the next sort of phase, which were the procedurals. And um, they range, it's a very big category, it ranges from the, the legal procedural to the police procedural, and it's gone on in contemporary times to become... It's all over television, of course, yeah. yeah. It's an obsession mm. with forensics, you know, was something yeah. simple like, you know, mm. tracing a footprint, and now it's, you know, carbon DNA. dating. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is, this mm. is science to the rescue, though. This is yes. the... the uh, um, uh, the, the the powers that can be brought to bear by the authorities. And I think we like these kind of stories in part because they're very reassuring in a sense. A, a murder's never a private act. You know, you wouldn't, want, uh, you wouldn't want to be the victim of a murder and there to be no consequences. And so these, these shows and this style of writing sort of indicates that the, 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 the force of the law will come down either with the most meticulous scientific analysis of the crime scene or or there will be someone at the centre of the investigation who, however flawed, is going through the strength of their character and their and their and their intuition and and so on to to be able to, in the end, catch the perpetrator. And life, justice will be done. But look yes. in real life how unreliable forensics can be. Forensic um, science convicted Mindy Chamberlain. Mm. Yes. And it was wrong. Yeah. But in the mm. television show, mm. yeah. it's always right. It's clear. Mm. It's 100% mm. right, always. What about the curious fact that a lot of the major figures in this sort of procedural forensic element, which is now very big, they're women. A lot of them are women. A lot of the writers yeah. are women. Oh, well, you see, it, yeah. it used to be that the that the central character in the police procedural was, uh, you know, an, a melancholic, alcoholic, m m homicide dick who'd seen everything at the bottom of the barrel, this middle-aged man That's despised right. the, by the his, his third yeah. wife and he alienated from his uh, children. Yes. His, co his bosses regarded him as insubordinate. He had a fractious relationship <laughs> with but his colleagues. But irresistible to women. But, but <laughs> beneath this, this crusty, soup-stained, you know, whiskey-breathing exterior, there was a, there was a sort of of heart of, uh, there was a heart of sort of gold and platinum. Of course, that figure's now been replaced over the last 25 years by the female forensic pathologist. Who's also drunk and... Uh, well, <laughs> she... Uh, yes, uh, with her colleagues. Uh, but but no in this case, she, she's got a Chanel suit and she computer profiles serial killers uh, using cutting-edge uh, technology yeah. and she, uh, you know, she has a BMW and stock options. Essentially, it's the same guy in drag... <laughs> 
and the case is solved by sending it down to the lab. That's I right. Think, I think there's a real difference, though, and I think that this is, you know, and I say this reluctantly as a woman, I think a lot of these um, f female forensic scientists take themselves too seriously. They don't have that lovely wit, black wit of the, of the male drunks. Mm. You know, they're sort of, they're kind of female wealthy neurotics. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and what, why is it that, that there's all this attention to detail with the fibres and all the rest mm. of the on television crime, yet these women have all this hair? Yeah. All this hair! It's going everywhere. Yeah. They're at the moment. Yeah. 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 The hair everywhere. Yeah. What about Sam on Silent Witness? <laughs> you know, did that woman ever crack a joke? <laughs> Let's, uh, let's name some names here. Okay, so we've got you know, Patricia Cornwall with um, Case okay, about Scarpetta. Okay. Um, we've got Cathy Rikes with uh, Tempe Brennan. Who, who else would you put in that category? <laughs> no, I hate those books. They're so badly written. <laughs> well, question. When you've got so much technology, does it matter how well or badly they're written? Oh, I think they do. It, it does. I once asked Cathy Rikes, I was on a cruise ship and she was lecturing. And I stood up at the back of the uh, auditorium and said, you, could, please, please uh, can you tell me uh, your literary influences? And she said, I have no literary influences. I read nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it showed. Did you, ask, <laughs> did you ask why do you write so badly? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> damn, the bouncers were already coming towards me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and in your field, you know, we've got Scott Turo and... Um, I think and Scott Turo is very good. Yeah. He's very good in Presumed Innocent. It's yeah, a superb it's book, uh, and it captures the atmosphere of a courtroom on a capital charge brilliantly. In fact, I find it hard to think of somebody who does that particular thing better. Obvious question. Why do people want to read crime? Why do they want to read about splatter, evil, ne'er-do-wells? Why? Why do we love it? I think, look, I think crime, the crime genre, is a smorgasbord. And I'm just using myself as a sort of, a, you know, an experimental punter here. It dep I, I go to different um, authors in the genre for different things. Mm. If I'm having a dark night of the soul, if I'm going through the worst experience of my life, which indeed has happened, I'll go to Agatha Christie. I want, I want a cosy, I want a hot water bottle, I want someone to hold my hand. If I'm feeling a little bit more uh, psychically robust, um, I might go to a James Elroy. Um, if I want, um, you know, a terrific laugh, I'll go to Shane. But it's, it depends. I think that's what I find so wonderful, particularly coming from poetry, about the crime genre, is its variety. Mm. I think the puzzle has something to do with it, solving puzzles, mm. working as a detective yourself as a reader and following the clues uh, yeah. that have been left by the writer. Uh, as the detective encounters them, you encounter them at the same time. But that's so there's really... a double pleasure in, involved. But that's really only the case in those sort of cosy style. I mean, the later crimes, like Elroy, I mean, the, he doesn't lay clues, he just splatters blood. I love no, it. No, there are, there are some happen. clues in the best Elroy. There's there there some yeah. very, very strong plots. Yeah. The Black yeah. Dahlia yeah. and some of the others. Yeah. And how it's all going to pan out, too, yes. is a puzzle. Yeah. Even though yeah, you yes, may there's know going the to end. be a resolution. Yeah. That's yeah. part of the implicit contract, I think, that yes. you're going to exactly. be taken on a trip, but, but you're going to go through the exit door at the end. There yes. is, you're going to, to know, or at least you know, suspect as much as any other character in the book, who, who did it or what it was or what motivated it. Yes. So it, it represents a form of, of kind of closure, I suppose, you know, in, in a world in which violence is all pervasive mm. and open-ended and we know in so many cases it's never resolved and well, that's justice right. is yeah. never done. Yeah. But somehow in, the, in, in this ride, whoever the writer is, whatever the style, high, low, uh, literary, crude, pulp, uh, travelogue, how, mm. pr pr procedural, private eye, you know, ultimately at the end that there is going to be some kind of resolution. And, and you mm. actually do restoration find... Restoration of order. And, yeah. and you do find yourself... that they're, they're very... That there is a sort of a moral flaw yeah. to a lot of crime novels. Dreadful things happen, but there are good, if flawed, people trying to yes. right mm. wrong. Mm. And I find mm. that satisfying in a book. And reassuring. Mm. Yeah. A little mm. bit reassuring. That yeah, it is. Society, that there are people who are, people are going to take There are people in society who are going to try to make this right. OK, I've asked... And we've talked about why people want to read it. Why do you guys want to write it? Dorothy? I mean, well, well, you've done it twice. Well, I've done it twice, but firstly with The Monkey's Mask, where I basically I was... I felt like I was Dr Frankenstein in a laboratory when I was mixing. I just wanted to see if I could sort of juggle these explosive elements. I wanted to see if I could merge poetry, crime and lesbian romance. And, <laughs> and, and not come and up readers, with readers, she has. She does. <laughs> <laughs> and then with El Dorado, it's kind of a, a buddy story, police procedural, um, you know, 
serial killer novel, basically. But uh, but for me, the, the ground is always poetry. I, because I feel that the some of the greatest stories ever have been in poetry. Um, and the great serial killer, of course, is Macbeth, and the great bad girl is Medea. Mm. And I suppose what I'm doing is extraordinarily traditional. I'm basically you, conservative. You once told me that you were sick of writing good. And yes. you wanted to write bad. <laughs> yes. And you certainly managed to. <laughs> I wanted to write very bad. But, but you've, you, you um, really hit the mark in the sense that it's, that it's about mood. Yes, as, yes. As, absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and the plot happens sort of sinuously throughout it, yeah. but, but you're right there with the characters in ways that, um, that would be, be clumsy and cloying mm. in, in a lot of mm. prose. Yeah. One thing I, was, uh, I read somewhere, but I really liked, was that the essential difference between a crime novel and every other novel is that the crime novel works the other way round, that an ordinary yeah. novel starts with a series of circumstances and characters and you go towards the end, whereas with a crime you start at the end, you start with the murder and then you go back into the crime. Mm -hmm. I think it depends. Yeah. I think that depends. Mm. Mm. But Agatha Christie mm. wrote the ending first, yeah. didn't she? I, can't, I don't even know. If, even yeah. if she didn't put it down first, it was in her head, mm -hmm. I'm sure. But is it, the character yes, of crime novels there, there's generally? There's something that's happened yeah. before the story has begun yeah. and, mm. and the there's story. a slow unravelling of, mm. of what it is that, mm. that has happened in the past that's triggered the subsequent events. There's a events. seismic yeah. event. Yeah. There's a crack through the world. There's and a crack, it starts. There's though. a crack in the cup, yeah. First mm. of all, whereas yeah. so often mm. you know, you're working towards the crack yeah. otherwise. You know. But I think it depends. I mean, the genre now has changed so much that I, I think it's very, very hard um, to make hard and f fixed rules about it. One thing I have found, though, with the crime genre, and this is speaking as a reader as well, they're very hard to end well. I call it mm. landing the plane. Mm. Most people mm. seem to bail out, crash, um, yes, you know, run into the tarmac. Dribble away. <laughs> Some yeah. of them, yes, well, they've yeah. got yeah. their ending. They, See? They, they, yeah. they, I, I think endings are so difficult to do yeah. in the genre. I think most, you know, good crime writers start well. It's finishing. Because sometimes yes. they end in a welter of sentimentality. Yes. Yeah. But so, it's, mm. it's interesting, I talked to Ian Rankin about this, the mm. great Scots writer, and he said that he has to actually write different endings for different countries. Mm. Uh, so the Americans demand a different end to the, uh, the end in the, that he'll write for the UK. Oh, right. yeah. Yes, they, 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 in the uh, US they hate irony, they hate a sort of dribbling end, they want everything tied up, you know, quickly. And, uh, that, yeah. and also because there's also a fear of ambivalence. Because I think a lot of crime novelists now try for a, a sense of real life ambivalence. I mean, I know I, I did that for the end of The Monkey's Mask, but mm. the film version of The Monkey's Mask ties the ends up because mm. that's how it has to but be. But that mm. defies the point that mm. um, Shane and Ian have made, which is that you mm. want certainty, you want resolution, you want reassurance that the world is whole You again. want everything mm. when you get a crime novel. I think that's why the genre yeah. is so... The <laughs> trouble is the crime novelist is turning into the literary novelist. Yes. Oh, and well, this is bad. destroying the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Getting ears. So that's right. <laughs> is that right? You think there's too much literature in crime these days? Well, I, I think you'd be hard put to, to find um, a better uh, book than, uh, than Peter Temple's uh, Broken Shore yeah. in, in terms of literary values, in terms of crime. He's found yeah. a, a way to synthesise this perfectly without apologies to yes. either. The novels of James Lee Burke as well, James Crumley, yeah. there are others. There's some terrific, terrific books. What next? Where will crime go next? Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's going to take over the world. <laughs> that, um, that uh, you know, it's uh, nice literature you got here. Pity, pity if anything should happen to it. That that that, uh, yeah. that it's it's so encompassing now um, yeah. that uh, that anything that guarantees the reader a a good time, I think, um, should be classified as crime. Yes. <laughs> now this is your chance. Each of you, we haven't. Sort of planned this, but <coughs> each of you like to name, you know, a couple of books that are among your absolutely favourites. So for people, they can share and um, and they can tell us what they think. Yeah. Embarrassment of riches. Mm. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Sorry, I should have given you warning, but yeah. we're going to go. I'll start with you, Shane. You have a wise look about you. The Big Sleep. <laughs> Raymond Chandler. <laughs> let's go. Let's go back to the to the to the yeah. classics. Okay, and the second. Um, well, um, James Lee Burke. I enjoy uh, James Lee Burke immensely. Um, a book like uh, Jukebox Cadillac, mm. Macho Lyricism. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Dorothy, stop scowling. I know. Speak I, up. I, I'm done, just trying to think. Um, just off the top of my head, I mentioned The Big Nowhere before from James Elroy because it 
I simply can't get it out of my mind. Well, that was part of that whole quartet. Yes, wasn't it, it? And, LA and also he does the unforgivable thing. He kills um, his hero. In the middle of the book and he leaves does. you alone with it's, all these yes. weird and strange it, people. It's extraordinary. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I'll also say... Um, oh, look, I'll, I'll give Dame Agatha um, her due. Um, death on the Nile. OK. Ian. Farewell, my lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. And you, you, you're allowed a second, but you don't have to take The big sleep. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's done it better than mm -hmm. Chandler. Now, Graham, it's not going to be easy for you, given that you review crime a lot. Do you have just a couple of all-time favourites? Well, James Lee Burke's already been mentioned, but I, I think he's my all-time favourite. Uh, we've mentioned Chandler, but in terms of contemporary writing, I go with Burke. Uh, Robert Parker, his uh, Spencer series, I still really enjoy. Anything by Dennis Lehane from, from Boston. You don't like Dennis Lehane? No, I love Dennis Lehane. Oh, he's, he's my third. Yes. Yes. Would you point to what, Mystic River or which one? Oh, I think any of them. The, the original series with the two private eyes, I liked, um, I can't think of the names offhand, but the, they were pretty damn good because they were so tough and so streetwise. Uh, um, and as I say, um, Robert Parker continues to churn out, and he really does write a lot of novels, but these really quite wonderful novels, I, I think. Excuse me, I was so shocked. I thought you said anyone bar Dennis Lehane. Oh, no, 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 oh, no Dennis great. Anyone bar he's, he's Dennis very, Lehane. very great, that yeah. man. <laughs> we will put uh, a list of those and, and the other books named on our website so you can dip in and enjoy. But basically, go Chandler. Really? Yes. I, I would just draw attention to one, because I'm a huge fan of Elroy too, but I remember when I picked up Silence of the Lambs, Thomas Hardy. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. For the first yes. time. I'm sorry, oh. none of you named Let me speak. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, thought, yeah. I thought that was almost a perfect mm. crime novel. Oh, That's one of the God. creepiest books yeah, ever. Oh. So scary. Creepy. Mm. Creepy, creepy. Yeah. The night goggles scene. Oh. Oh. Right. <laughs> now they all want my <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> I think we'll stick with your production. It's going to take over the world. I hope you've enjoyed our program tonight. Thank you so much to my guests, Shane Maloney, Dorothy Porter, Graham Blundell and Ian Callanan. I hope we have thoroughly creeped you out and reawakened the taste for crime. And, of course, I will see you for our regular First Tuesday Book Club. Thank you so much for watching and good night. For more ABC TV vodcasts, go to the website abc.net.au forward slash TV forward slash video.